um, thanks very much. Robert's actually my collaborator, so I'm glad he remembers what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so anyway, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you um, all very much for staying for the last day, even if you've only stayed to see Neil's talk after mine. Um, and I'd also especially like to thank Slava for inviting me to what's been a really nice conference, one of the nicest I've been to and the most enjoyable. So we'll, hopefully we can try and keep it that way for the next hour. Um, Okay, so yeah, so what I'm trying to talk about is something that combines two of the ideas that we've been talking about at this uh, workshop. Um, and uh, so, so the ideas of, of using uh, integrable one-dimensional models uh, with a truncated spectrum, and also the idea of using matrix product states, um, <coughs> but basically stapling those two ideas together to try and study two-dimensional systems. So... Um, First of all, so, so what's the sort of the motivation? Obviously, we'd like to learn something about 2D strongly correlated systems. So, and I apologize in advance for my handwriting. So we'd like to know something about uh, 2D strongly correlated physics. Uh, not least of all because of experiments. So obviously there are experimental realizations of layered systems or systems that are quasi-2D, or I guess even in the case of graphene, systems that are truly 2D, but graphene is not a strongly correlated system, so uh, maybe I'm not interested in it. Um, so experimental realizations, so things like uh, the cuprates, which have been interesting for a long time and remain extremely difficult, um, although uh, we heard from Philippe Colbeau that there's some very exciting progress being made on the 2D Hubbard model. Um, so things like cuprates, things like uh, sort of layered quantum magnets, things that were <coughs> considered to be possible manifestations of things like spin liquid behavior, like cesium cl copper chloride in the past. Uh, then we also have things like, um, things like uh, systems of coupled quantum wires, so, uh, a couple of quantum wires. So you can imagine some kind of uh, substrate where someone lays down many sort of channels that are individually 1D, but they, there's tunneling between them of some sort. <coughs> and then, of course, there's cold atomic gases. So, oh, ultra cold atomic gases, but cold atoms. So, in many cases in cold atoms, um, what, what you might do, uh, you might have some kind of one-dimensional trap, but usually what they actually do is they form um, lots of these 1D traps, many, many copies, so they have all of these kind of tubes. And you can imagine that they can, well, in fact, they can um, uh, alter, because they have such high, high precision, fine control over their experiments, they can alter the, the coupling between these things, so they could allow hopping between the 1D atomic gases. So there's some experimental motivation. Um, we can also think, though, uh, about the fact that we have all of these great techniques in 1D. So, so we have, in one dimension, as I said, we have um, matrix product states. <coughs> so <laughs> 1D methods are basically sort of cleaned up in 1D. So we have um, numerical methods, like matrix product states, which is just sort of essentially excellent in 1D. Um, then we have integrability, which admittedly does not cover all one-dimensional models, but it covers a sort of library of many different types of model with many different universalities, many different interesting exotic behaviors. So, so we have in, in 1D, 1D, we have great numerical and analytical understanding. <coughs> There's that handwriting. Right. So, um, yeah, so this has given us some really good understanding of things that sort of very, well, precise understanding of exotic physics, things like um, spin, <coughs> spin charge separation, fractionalization. <coughs> so what we'd like to know is if, if there's one, some way that we can, can we extend the power of these methods, even in some limited sense.
to height dimensions. So that's one question. Then we'd also like to think, um, uh, in fact, can, can our knowledge of 1D help us decode 2D? So if we have some system that we can actually simulate, the, you know, we can study some 2D system, can our knowledge of 1D excitations somehow help us understand what's going on in 2D? Um, And put another way, you could also say, um, how does the structure of these 1D systems, when we couple them together, change as we go to the two-dimensional case? So these are sort of some of the questions that we're, we're wondering about while, we, while we've developed, been developing this method. Um, OK, so, so first of all, uh, well, uh, we've had several talks about matrix product states now. So, um, and I think many of the experts <coughs> in matrix product states are still have left, but some of them are still here. But, but um, uh, Philippe Corbeau gave a really, really thorough coverage, I think, of matrix product, matrix product states and tensor methods. But I just want to do a very brief reminder because we've had a day in between, and, and obviously this is not a matrix product states conference. Not everyone knows about them. So, just to remind, remind people of some of the terminology, really. Okay, so um, so the idea is that we have some lattice models. Say um, there are things called continuous matrix product states about which I know very little. Um, but I think there was a question yesterday. I think Brian was asking something about continuum. There, there, there are such things as continuum, as continuous matrix product states. So you may be interested in that. Um, but what I'll talk about is on the lattice. So, uh, so, so we have some, some lattice of sites, um, and each one of these sites, I'm going to give some local Hilbert space of dimension d sigma, uh, and uh, so we have some state which, try not to mess this up. OK, so we know that we can just write it as some superposition of product states. So if I have L sites, <coughs> OK, so I can write it as a linear superposition of the states on the sites. Um, and the idea of matrix product states is to write this in a slightly different way. And so I'm assuming open boundary conditions here. Is that still legible at the back? Are the indices and things legible? Yep. OK, good. So um, my sigmas are good? Let's not be rude. Okay. Um, <laughs> come on, Robert. I'm British. I can't start randomly. Um, OK, so now I'm going to get nasty questions from uh, OK, so the, um, OK, uh, yeah, so, so the point is, this, this at first sight, um, at least when I was a graduate student, or whenever I first saw this, this looked crazy, because it looked like I'd taken something that I understood and put it in a very complicated form that looked to me like it was going to be much worse. But the, the, the point is that this thing here, um, obviously, is some, uh, has some terrible behavior. So it's an exponentially large uh, object. The idea here is that, in principle, to do this exactly, um, we would need at the center of our system. So if we, if we consider cutting our system in half, the size of the matrices in the middle of the system would need to go like uh, d sigma to the L over 2. But in practice, we look for the board rubber. Here it is. Right. So, um, but that's not what we do, because that would be silly. Um, instead, what we do is we restrict our, our matrices to have some maximum dimension called the bond dimension, effectively, because it is the dimension <coughs> linking two sites, hence the bond. So, so we instead have some maximum Okay, 
Uh, and then instead, if we've done that, um, then we're going to have uh, some polynomial number of coefficients instead, so something that looks like this instead. <coughs> so that's a massive saving, but obviously we've lost some information by doing that. <coughs> so then this, kind of, this is a kind of compression technique. We've basically compressed our wave function in some way. Sorry, I can use the side black balance. Thank you for permission. Right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'll use them first. Right. So the, uh, so the idea is why, how do we choose this compression and, um, and I in what way? Um, and essentially the answer is we, we do it based on singular value decompositions and Smith decompositions. Um, and so just in case that isn't familiar to some people, so the idea is that we could take any system here uh, any system, and we can by partition it into two parts, A and B. Um, so again, we can write our wave function. Uh, using bases defined on A and B. Um, but there is a transformation that we can apply, so we can apply a singular value decomposition to this C, such that it becomes um, three matrices, uh, so two orthogonal matrices and a matrix of what's called singular values. So, um, so this is a, a set of, of orthonormal columns instead of orthonormal rows. Um, if I give it just some. So if I just keep the, if I just keep the non-zero singular values, then already this is a square matrix. Um, <coughs> OK, so, so now I can, oh, one more sum over S. So now if I perform the sums over A and B, what I've done is basically just rotated my bases. So, so what happens is I have some new, um, some new representation in terms of some new states, uh, which I will call, which I will label by S. But the point now is that the, the number of the superpositions that I need to keep is the minimum of the dimension of, um, well, actually, how do I write this? Not like that, probably. Um, the minimum of the dimension, oh no, of A, the dimension of B. So by choosing a different basis, effectively, I can have a more compact representation already. But also, if I look at the normalization of this wave function, then this is just the sum over these singular values squared. So if I choose to keep the largest, say, chi of them, which is my bond dimension, then what I'm doing is, um, is I'm, having, I'm keeping the best representation of that state with respect to the Frobenius norm. So that's basically what you're doing. You do some kind of iterative scheme, say, uh, you treat this as some sort of variation or ansatz for your wave function, you do some iterative scheme where you uh, do lots of Schmidt decompositions, lots of singular value decompositions, and you compress this state. Um, now, when does this work well? When does it not work well? Let's go over and use another blackboard. So, um, so we, can, we can sort of sum up the distribution of these singular values, because obviously trun truncating them depends really on, on how they behave. So if there's uh, some exponential fall off in the singular values, then we might think that if we truncate here, we're not doing too badly. Uh, on the other hand, if we have a distribution of singular values that looks like that, Clearly, truncating is just not a good idea anywhere. So, um, or at least it doesn't seem to be. So, so a sort of a one, an easy uh, single quantity that can kind of sum up the distribution is the von Neumann entropy um, of entanglement. So, so based on the notation that I've been using, like that. So, so essentially we sum over our singular values in this way, and this is the von Neumann entropy of entanglement. So uh, if for a product state between our, if our, if our bipartitioning was such that actually we just had a product state, then this would be zero. Um, on the other hand, if all singular values are equal uh, and we have chi of them, then we have, uh, that's the maximal case, then we would find that we have uh, SE equals log chi. So the maximum entanglement we can keep across any partition in this case 
is log chi if we have bond dimension chi. Okay, so so then what's the problem? Um, well, okay, so why does it work well in one D? Sorry, is really the the question. So it works well in one D because of certain theorems or proofs even about the behaviour of the entanglement entropy of gapped systems in 1D. So um, I think it was already mentioned that the proofs go back to Hastings originally, and then sort of um, I think there's a more recent uh, improvement on the bound by Arad, Arad et al. Uh, but the idea basically is that in a one-dimensional gap system, the entanglement entropy um, goes like some, well, the, the entanglement entropy uh, is, is bounded, is, um, well, it grows like a correlation length in the system. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and moreover, in, but, uh, okay, and even, even in critical gap, well, in systems described by a CFT, um, so in critical systems in, in general, um, <coughs> the point is that this, uh, if you take a bipartitioning where you cut out some system of, of length L in the middle, then your entanglement will actually just grow like L. So there's like a logarithmic um, breaking of what's called this area law. So, sorry, should I should say what the area law is. So, so in high dimensions, it's believed that in general, there's an area law, which is uh, sort of obvious in 1D. In 1D, the area law is just an, a finite number of points. If I cut my system up into pieces, then the area law is just um, you know, some, some number of points. If I, just, if I choose to look at the entanglement of this region with the rest, then the area law is just two finite points. In higher dimensions, if I'm looking at the, part, the, um, the entanglement between some region and another region, then this boundary goes like some extensive length. Uh, and so we have some, some area to our entanglement. So the point is that in 1D, we have at worst this logarithmic growth, which means that even in critical systems, we can get something out by careful, careful extrapolation or careful, carefully controlled uh, nu numerics where we look at different bond dimensions. But in higher dimensions, we have difficulties because the entanglement tends to just grow like this, like a, like a length, um, which means that we need to keep more and more singular values. Our matrices get bigger and we have problems. Um, so. So Has what it been drawn into D for gap systems, the area law? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. No, no, no. I think. no. no it, it has not, no, right. I mean, there's plenty of, of work. It's true, but it's no, yeah, there's plenty of, of evidence, but there's no, there's no fundamental proof in the, in the manner of Hastings' proof, right, for 1D. Um, so, 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 okay, so, so Philippe, and Didier were telling us about PEPs, and PEPs is explicitly constructed to capture the area law, um, and indeed, uh, you know, does very well in, in for 2D systems. However, it has very complicated algorithms and quite a large computational overhead, um, and and it also doesn't use our pre-existing knowledge of 1D, which is what I'm trying to motivate here: is that we can somehow feed our pre-existing knowledge of 1D systems in. Um, <coughs> on the other hand, there's also taking matrix product states themselves and, uh, <coughs> and um, trying to, to make, a 1D, take, make a 1D system like a 2D system, so, or the other way around, in fact. So we have some two-dimensional lattice. Now see why <coughs> Philippe used slides to show his pictures, because it's easier to draw them. Um, so I just draw some. Okay, so imagine that we had periodic boundary conditions here, so this comes off and joins back on here. So the idea in, in this sort of 2D normal MPS is that you, you form a snaking path where you, you map your 2D system back to 1D <coughs> by kind of going through the system like this. Okay, but what's, what's difficult about that, um, and there are lots of, lots of work doing that, especially um, uh, people, Steve, Stephen White has done a great deal of, of extensive, uh, successful numerical work doing this. But the, the problem is that um, the things that were originally short-range bonds in 2D have now gone long-range. Um, <coughs> and because they've gone long-range, um, and they're also having to carry all of the entanglement between these two sides like this, 
we basically have a, a situation where the required <coughs> bond dimension goes exponentially in the in the in the uh, circumference of our cylinder. Um, <coughs> moreover, at least in this particular uh, manifestation, the fact that we had translation invariance around this way hasn't been taken in, hasn't been used explicitly in the algorithm. So, um, so there's no use of the fact that the momentum is is conserved. Uh, and the conservation of good quantum numbers is extremely useful in these matrix polar state algorithms because it makes them much more efficient. This looks so weird that it's even, even surprising that somebody decided to use this. Um, <laughs> why not use other curves? I mean, there are many curves. Ah, okay. Okay, there are, there are other. Okay, so people have worked on these algorithms, and I believe there are ones where people um, do some kind of other path where they, they kind of basically do a sort of 45 degree rotation and go through, and sometimes that has better convergence properties. <laughs> so, so, so actually the path does matter and you can choose different paths. So, um, okay, so, so these are, these are pre-existing techniques. So, so, but the, the idea we, well, the thing that we work on is a slightly different angle on this. So, um, Do you not like my drawing? So, no, no. <laughs> okay. um, so, so what have we done? So what, what we do is, part, is, is in fact partly in, inspired by the, the truncated spectrum approach. Um, so what we do is we say, well, we have some Hamiltonian. We think about having some Hamiltonian that is a sum of some H solvable plus some interaction. Um, and but we happen to choose our H solvable so that it is in fact a bunch of uncoupled 1D Hamiltonians and then we choose something here that is a relevant interchain interaction so relevant for the reasons that Gabor stressed on Monday, because we expect that's when the truncated spectrum approach is going to work. Um, so, so this seems like it, you know, a nice idea maybe, but you can there are immediate issues with it. So, so for one, um, so issue one, um, continuum one D theories, or continuum. 1D chains will have an infinite spectrum um, and on the other hand if we work with lattice chains so then at least when we go to long, long chain lengths they will just they will have a very large spectrum. Uh, neither of these are good <coughs> because we're working with a numerical technique where we need the local physical Hilbert space dimension <coughs> to be finite at the very least. And in fact, the algorithms are more efficient if that's a smaller number. Um, <coughs> uh, so, yeah. So, so I guess really that is <coughs> issue issue one and two. In fact, so so because issue two is then that. Um, that the scaling, for example, of a of like a DMRG algorithm, which is the uh, an eigen solving um, an eigen solver basically for matrix product states. Um, I think the scaling is what it's for a, what's called a single site algorithm goes something like this. Um, but there are subleading terms that go something like this. So usually people think about this as the leading order term because chi is very large. Um, on the other hand, if, delt if, uh, if this um, if the local Hilbert space dimension is also getting large, then this sort of term is also extremely important. So, so neither thing is great. Uh, so so the, the sort of partial fixes that we have here So, so one is as before for the truncated spectrum approach, which is that we put our theory on a finite size system. It's 
not as nice when they don't have the nice people to uh, clean the board in between with the little squeegee and things, is it? Um, so, okay, so, so fixes are... Because this introduces some some discreteness in our spectrum, so we now have some some energy level spacing, um, or some spacing between momentum modes at least, um, that goes like some function of two, well, so of, of one over r. Um, then, uh, so then the, the next thing to do is to make sure we're using conserved quantities. So we want to take advantage of the fact that. Um, this length is in which direction? In the direction of the, because... It's the length of the chain. Okay. Sorry, that's a really useless drawing, isn't it? Um, so, I, so let me actually draw... Where are the, the one-dimensional HIs live in this picture? Horizontally yeah. or vertically? Horizontally. Okay. Uh, sorry, vertically. Sorry, so I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> At least the way I normally think of them, sorry, is like this. So I take these, these chains and I couple them. And each one of these is an hi, an h1d. Yeah. Okay. And then this is of length r. And the thing about matrix product state methods is that we can work with many chains n, but you can also work directly in the thermodynamic limit with infinitely many chains. So, <coughs> so yeah. So then we also want to use conserved quantities. Uh, so we want to use chain momentum, for example. So we don't just have finite length chains. We put them on a ring. So we have periodic boundary conditions. So really. These things are not just some of the things. These are actually rings. So. so we want to organize our chain spectra by their momentum. Uh, and there's one sort of final heuristic kind of wishful hope, which is that um, so massive field theories uh, in <coughs> finite size, the, the corrections to the masses, uh, the masses of excitations in these theories go exponentially <coughs> in the length. So when you sort of confine your QFT to a box, you expect that the, the corrections to the masses will drop off exponentially. Um, and so the hope is that for some quantities at least, we can get away with using a smaller R. So we can sort of study this system on a relatively small ring, uh, well, with relatively small rings, infinitely many of them, say, and hope to get nearer the thermodynamic limit with a smaller r. And the reason that the smaller r is useful is because r, in this case now, when we have our matrix product state, we do a bipartitioning. This r here is the r that appears in the area law. So r is the area. So the, the kind of hope is that, that this is like the, the finite size corrections, and then we can use small r smaller r and hope, well hope that we can use smaller r and then of course because SE is scaling roughly like r we can get away with um, not having a completely out of control bond dimension. Okay so that, those are the... That depends on the dynamics because you're now going to couple them to each other, right? So thank you. Ultimately yeah it's heuristic, right? It's, it's it not, be not true. It could be not true, so it's a hope, that's why I was trying to stress it really is kind of a, a hope that, that that might help you. So really the proof is in the pudding, you have to try it and it may or may not work and it especially may not work in the dynamics when you actually quench, when you go from, which I'll talk about in a bit, where you, you, you couple these chains together suddenly and you watch what happens and they evolve. Ultimately you expect that you're you've pumped a load of energy into the system with a global quench, say, and you know, ultimately you are going to, you are going to change things dramatically, eventually. Um, okay, so the ingredients were, we wanted uh, some kind of solvable one-dimensional Hamiltonians, and we need to know also know the matrix elements. So explicitly the kind of um, Hamiltonian, so to, just to write it more explicitly, the, the Hamiltonian I'm gonna think about really the type of Hamiltonian I'm going to think about um, something like this. So, uh, sorry, still have my sum over i, and these operators. Like this. Okay, so I integrate around the track chains my operators because these are defined on some continuum. Okay, so. 
so, uh, and so I've drawn a, an unpleasant sketch picture here, but, but yeah, so the idea is that you know, these things are not just coupled at some point to each other, they're coupled all the way around to each other. Okay, um, so, so does it work? So, so, so the, the first test system that we've looked at, um, starting originally when Robert first came up with this, this idea in 2008 or 2009, he... And so operator OI is, uh, has dimension less than one. Which operator? Sorry? O o OI hat. OI hat has a pretty small dimension, right? Because we, we want this whole product OI, OI plus one, has dimension smaller than two. Yeah, so, so I mean, I guess if we're looking at the IC model, um, but we want a relevant interaction ultimately, right? So, but for the IC model, um, sig that is I not a good sigma. sigma. That's not a good sigma, I apologize. Right, um, so yeah, so now the, the dimension is one eighth, right? I think that's right. So, so that's a small, okay. Um, yeah, okay, so, so the icing model. Um, and I think most people know about the icing model, but I'll just write it down just to be explicit. Um, So, so the model on the lattice, at least, is this. go to the continuum limit, we know that, um, actually if I got the sign here right, well, it doesn't matter, hmm. um, that when we take the continuum limit, we end up with a, a free, uh, the theory of a free Majorana field with a mass. Uh, so this, I think, what is it, something like this. Uh, so we end up with two parameters, of a velocity, a speed of light, which will set to one and a, and a mass, and the mass, uh, depending on the sign, uh, well, so if I draw it like this, there is an ordered phase for positive mass. Order. Oh, God. Right. Order. <laughs> <laughs> and disorder. Right. That's not good. Some neurons have failed this morning. They may never come back. Um, right. So, so we have this. Uh, and then the idea is that we would couple them with um, some other interaction. <laughs> Uh, so now, now I'll sort of put another index. So J was my index along the chains. I is now my index between chains. And we'll couple them with some spin-spin interaction. Okay, so then we want to study, study the continuum limit of this. Um, sorry, so then we, then we want to take the continuum limit of the 1D model, couple it together with things like this, or the continuum operator version of it. Um, and then see what happens. And so, so there are basic checks that, that you could do. So one of them is that the, you expect that the gap um, will scale like, will have some scaling form, just like this, delta Is that correct? Yes. OK. So that would be one check. Another check is, <coughs> OK, so another check is when I actually draw the, the 2D phase diagram. So I have delta, I have j perp, we have order and disorder. So there is a quantum phase transition here uh, for some particular value of the of the net, well, if, we, if we're in the disordered phase, we start with disordered chains and we couple them together with increasingly strong interaction, we'll expect a phase transition into the ordered phase. So, <coughs> so those are two checks that we could do. We can check uh, for some, something like this, the scaling relation. We can also check, do we see the quantum phase transition? Do we get, say, a critical exponent, right, or something, something close to the right critical exponent? Um, okay, so we can put the uh, screen on and I'll drag the boards out of the way. Okay. okay. 
Thank you. Bang. That's what you get. Okay. Uh, right. So. Okay. So here is a bunch of data that Robert took. Uh, so he used the traditional DMRG rather than a matrix product state algorithm actually to do this. Sorry. Yeah, the names are all important here. I'm not on this. So there we are. Um, <coughs> Uh, yeah, so, so here he, he basically showed that uh, he looked at a bunch of different parameters and showed that they all collapse onto some nice scaling curve. So we see this expected uh, scaling behavior. Uh, maybe more interestingly then, <coughs> he also looked at what happens as you increase J perp uh, when you start on the disorder side. So you start with, I think, the mass is minus one. Uh, and then he increased the coupling between the chains and monitored what happened to the gap. So in this case, the gap, uh, you expect it to start closing, of course, uh, and that's what he sees. Um, so there's two different things here. One is, is the raw data out of his DMIG for which I think this was 60 chains coupled together, um, and they weren't particularly long. I think R was, R was 7 or something like that. 10, was it? Okay, fine. So it, was, it wasn't too bad. Uh, but he already gets uh, this value new equals 0 0.65 just with this raw data without doing any extrapolation in size. Uh, and without doing any kind of like, this is a kind of one loop uh, RG improvement in the, in the cutoff on his truncation on his chains. Uh, and this is quite good agreement with the accepted exponent, uh, which I think is 0.63, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so there is this clear evidence that this is capturing something about the 2D quantum phase transition, because of course the, the 1D quantum phase transition new is just one. So it's very far from that. And in fact, if you go to really small r, if you make R really small, then your spectrum kind of separates, right? And you can actually recapture the 1D phase transition. You can go back to a completely different coupling. Uh, I mean, the, the, the critical coupling changes, obviously. <coughs> but also, you'll see a different critical exponent. It will go to new equals 1. Um, so when I came along and uh, started working with Robert and basically started MPSizing everything, uh, one of the first things we did is we started looking at the entanglement because people were interested in the entanglement content of, of these systems. In particular, people are interested in the entanglement content of 2D strongly correlated systems. And uh, Didier, the other day, was talking about this, this conjecture of due to Lee and Haldane about entanglement spectra. So here is a plot, in fact, of some entanglement spectra. So this side here, this is uh, far from the transition. Uh, this is getting closer to the transition. Um, and so what I can do is I can bipartition the cylinder, look at the distribution of the singular values, or look at the values, the actual singular values themselves, construct this fictitious Hamiltonian. Um, so the idea is that there's the idea due to Lee and... Oh, oh sorry, that doesn't go any higher than that, does it? No. Okay. Um, the reduced density matrix, you can reformulate it as some kind of exponential of some entanglement Hamiltonian. Uh, and then the conjecture was that in certain weird cases, this entanglement Hamiltonian looks like the real Hamiltonian of an edge, although it depends on what you, what you understand to be the theory of your edge. So in the case where we have some chains and we're far from criticality and they're somewhat weakly coupled and the entanglement we know is, uh, is mostly area law, so that there's short range entanglement basically, um, it's maybe clear or believable that the edge of your system really is a single icing chain. Uh, so in that case, what we see is actually quite a nice overlap between um, so the, these uh, open, open symbols here are for actual edge, actual spectra of an icing chain, uh, collecting it into the various different states. So the one soliton states being the Ramond sector, <coughs> the lowest Ramond sector, and the two soliton being the lowest Neville Schwartz. Um, <coughs> and then because you have access to actually the charges of the various, um, various states represented by the singular values, you can also see whether they're even or odd in, in the Nevo Schwartz. Well, if they're even, they're basically Nevo Schwartz-like. Uh, if they're odd, they're Ramond-like, these, these singular values. And you can see that there's some pretty good agreement in terms of at least structure and degeneracies. Uh, and we also did some kind of perturbative calculation of the entanglement, of the lowest entanglement band, I suppose you could call it. Um, I should also point out that this has been scaled because uh, there's a kind of unknown constant here. Um, it's been scaled so that these two symbols overlap each other, basically. Um, 
but yeah, but there's also a perturbative calculation, which it happens to have a, a sort of large subleading correction at, at zero momentum, which I haven't included here. Uh, so that's why it disagrees here, but there's quite good agreement, at least with the perturbative calculation of this entanglement spectra, which is another kind of check that we're getting the kind of right thing out. Uh, on the other hand, as you go closer to criticality, it's not clear that your entanglement is short range. It's not clear what your edge theory really is. Uh, and certainly there's, much, there's, no, there's not really an agreement anymore between these different uh, theories. But of course, it's not clear that the, the edge Hamiltonian, in this case, is an icing chain. Uh, okay, so, so that was just sort of about the entanglement spectrum. In that case, the public has something to do with the spectrum of the radars in, in the, on the boundary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's known, right? Some extent. Some extent. So would you be able to calculate this, um, or you'd be able to calculate some sort of edge CFT? You'd be able to, to, to looking at the, the, ed, the CFT that represents the edge in some way? And possibly the two plus one theory. Yeah, the two plus one theory. When you mm -hmm. take operators to the boundary, okay, depending on the boundary condition, mm -hmm. you get some boundary operators which have certain scaling dimensions, mm -hmm. and some of these dimensions are known. So maybe they can, maybe you can try to make them on this plot. Well, that would be nice, definitely. Uh, well, yes. Well, I mean. No, no, with, no this, with, this, with this boundary bootstrap calculations that uh, Pedro, Leander, and uh, Griotze did, they, I think they got even many digits. But I think sure. the entanglement spectrum for such a half plane is, is the CFT in Rindler space, like it's like a thermal density matrix of the CFT in, in, in some Rindler space time, so I think it's, it's not the spectrum in flat space, not even with the boundary, but something more complicated. I think you've tried to explain this to me before and I didn't understand, so maybe you could explain it to me again after the talk. Cause, okay. um, yeah, so, so the, then the next thing we looked at was, was, was dynamics. So, so the idea here, again, to say what a quantum quench is, um, so the idea is that we take some system in some initial state, um, psi zero, uh, and then we evolve it under some new Hamiltonian, under some Hamiltonian for which it is not an eigenstate, effectively. So, so, uh, so you can imagine it, it being the case that there's some H zero, and then, sorry, at t less than zero. This one does go a bit further up. And then at t greater than zero, we suddenly add in some, some, some new term. Um, in fact, this is not what I'm trying to say at all, is it? OK, so what I'm trying to say is that um, we have some, some Hamiltonian h0 at t less than zero, and then we have some new Hamiltonian for t equals zero, uh, or t greater than or equal to zero. And so we take some state, which is an eigenstate of the original Hamiltonian, and we evolve it in time under this new Hamiltonian, and we see what happens. So that's what's happened here. So the easiest thing for, for us to do with this um, theory, what do you, what do you, v is. v is something, but I'm going to say what it is in this case, yeah? So in this case, what we've done is we've started with a load of uncoupled chains, icing chains, and then we've suddenly turned on the spin-spin coupling. So, so we've gone from j perp is zero to 0.1. Uh, and then what we're tracking here actually is because we know about the structure of the, the icing, um, chains, we can look at the density of fermions on an icing chain. So what this is is just like looking at, um, because it's translation invariant as well, it's, it's easy to sort of just divide by R and find what you expect the density of fermions at a point to be. So, <coughs> so this is like the density of fermions on chain I at, at, position, at some position uh, as a function of time. So initially uh, the chains are in their vacuum states, nothing happened, and then you've turned on this perturbation, uh, you've injected energy into the system, and what you're seeing is these kind of um, uh, is these modes evolving, and I suppose what I should say is <coughs> remind people about this kind of quasi-particle picture. So, so there's this uh, quasi-particle picture due to Calabrese and Cardi, which kind of says that um, you have your system at t equals zero, and when you perform the quench, 
it, uh, the energy sort of acts as a, as a source of quasiparticles. So you have these kind of quasiparticles moving off. Um, from different points, and when these uh, the, the light cones from these various different quasiparticles intersect, that's when you start to build up co correlations between them. Um, so, so there's a couple of timescales that you might think you might see in this kind of plot. So one of the, I've, I've sort of scaled it by T delta, but the point is that, um, well, okay, so the most important timescale really in this plot, seeing as I'm running out of time, is really just that uh, everything's on a ring, or well not everything, but the fermions are on a ring, we create them, and then they travel around, and there's some time when they will touch, when they, when uh, quasiparticles created from the same point, we'll see each other again at the other end of the ring. So that's plotted on here, and you can see that for different lengths, basically everything seems to fall onto a universal curve with the right, if you scale things correctly, uh, as you go up larger and larger in R. So but why are you not already talking between rings, or is this a different scale? Or? Between rings, what about? Yeah, you're not co you're coupling them. All the all the rings are coupled. Yeah. Right. So I mean, energy can move from one ring to another. It can, yeah, it can. So obviously that's an effect as well. Yeah. But somehow, as we go to larger R, at least this is also an effect, right? This is right. this is also something that will happen. Sure. Okay, but I'm on an infinitely long system here as well, so they're never going to hop from one end to the system to the other sure. that way. So the, at least one of the obvious timescales that I can talk about is is this one. Okay. So that's all. Is that? Um, okay, and then you can see already this does significantly better than perturbation theory. And uh, the reason, I guess, there is because this is actually a sum over the nevo schwartz and the Ramond modes. And uh, the perturbation theory, at least at lowest order, doesn't capture the nevo schwartz the half-integer modes at all. They're just completely zero. So, they, so this is already kind of capturing something they don't. Uh, and you can see, uh, if you go to a weaker coupling, of course, the things agree again because these half-integer modes just don't get excited very much. Okay, so then something, um, <coughs> sort of looking at some pretty pictures. Okay, so, so this is a quench in the disordered phase where we're actually looking at spin-spin correlations. Um, and so this picture on the, this is not a laser pointer. So this is a laser pointer. Okay, so this picture on the left um, shows correlations uh, parallel to the chains as you go around this way. This is correlations <coughs> as you go along the system. Okay, so, so here we see something that looks like a light cone, right? Uh, so I'm, I've subtracted off the, the t equals zero correlations, <coughs> um, just to make it more clear, because, it, because the chains are, I think this is length r equals 20, there are some, some correlations already at t equals zero, and you kind of have to subtract them um, to sort of see this more clearly. Um, so the idea here was, uh, well, the idea here is that this, this is a disordered quench, so, okay, so these quasiparticles created, they can move off, as you said, in both directions. They don't just go around the ring, but they also hop from chain to chain, and you can see that quite clearly right on the right. Um, however, there's an interesting, uh, well, it's an interesting paper in 2016 by Kormos, Kalora, uh, Gabor, and Pasquale uh, in Nature Physics about um, looking at confinement, or real-time confinement, in a 1D quantum icing model with a longitudinal field, so. But, but can I ask another yeah. question before I get there? I mean, one of the interesting things one could try to do is this kibble zurich scaling. Mm -hmm. That is, if you tune yourself to, I mean, if you're close to, you go through the critical point itself. Mm -hmm. right? I, don't, I don't remember how close your J curve is to the actual. This is far, point. this is far, far from the critical point. Then you might try to Okay, so this gets very difficult as you get to towards yes, the critical point. Maybe it's just very difficult. But and so, <coughs> in principle, try to uh, use the critical exponents of mm -hmm. the 2D, uh, 2 plus 1 dimensional Ising to predict the behavior of this scaling wise, qualitatively, the response. Well, that would definitely be interesting to do. I mean, so in, 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 in that case, in that case, we can only really go to very short times when we do a strong quench like that. Um, because obviously, what happens is your truncation becomes important. The fact is we've right. put lots of energy in the system right. um, and uh, higher modes. So, so I guess what I you didn't see on the previous plot is uh, if I'd broken up into the modes that I'd summed up to get that, you can see that <coughs> higher and higher nevo schwartz Ramon modes are less and less populated. Mm -hmm. But of course they become more and more populated in a quench that's stronger, right? So, so and they get worse over time. So it's more difficult to, to study a, a quench that gets close to the critical point or even crosses the critical point. Because you might expect this is not the great, a great basis. Disordered icing chains coupled together, you would think that maybe ordered icing chains coupled together is the better basis mm -hmm. for, for once you've gone through. So it's tough. 
Um, yeah, so, so, uh, so essentially, I just haven't really got time, so I just draw a kind of cartoon. But the idea is that you have some icing model, and normally if you flip a spin, you create some domain walls. And these domain walls can propagate independently of each other. And so you have some deconfined excitations that just propagate independently once you've done a spin flip. On the other hand, if you add in a longitudinal field, what that's basically doing is giving a penalty to either up or down. So the longitudinal field gives some penalty that's proportional to the length L of this flipped domain. Uh, and that acts like a linear confining potential. So, so what they did is they, they studied this and they saw very nicely that they could destroy the light cone, basically, by, um, by quenching into a phase where they had the longitudinal, uh, longitudinal field. Uh, so, so we've also, well, what we've done here is we've started in an ordered with an ordered um, set of ordered chains and then quenched to a system where they're actually coupled together. So we start with ordered chains but no coupling between them um, and then we quench suddenly <coughs> to coupling to, to the system where they're coupled so they can hop between each other. Um, and so on the left, okay, so here I haven't subtracted off the initial correlations because they're, they're quite strong and if I subtract this off, you just kind of get junk. Um, but on the right, this is actually the correlations as I'm going along the system. And you can see that what was, what was certainly something light cone-like in this case doesn't really look light cone-like anymore. It's much more of a kind of... Um, well, there is some growth, but it doesn't seem to, to proceed out in light cone fashion. It really bends back on itself. Okay, so there's some evidence, I think, here of confinement as well in this 2D <coughs> system. Of, the, of this picture that is very nice in 1D with a particular um, field applied. In this case, there's no field applied. It's the fact that you have the ordered icing chains either side of your chain. So when you flip a spin on your chain, because you've got ordered chains on either side, they provide the kind of linear confining potential. So it's not an applied external field. It's really actually a property of the phase itself. Um, OK, so, so this is the very last part of the talk now. So, so we might think also, um, OK, so I, I argued that part of the point here was how can we use our knowledge of 1D to try and understand 2D. Um, so one of the ways is maybe by looking at these modes on the, on the, on the, Fermi, on the icing chain and understanding what's happening in the quench based on those. Another <coughs> way um, we might understand it is that we have other ways maybe of truncating our spectra. So we know something about the 1D, uh, the 1D theory, so we also know something about its matrix elements, say, if we're going to study it in this way. Uh, so maybe there are other ways of truncating, um, rather than just based on energy. So in this particular case, um, what, we've, what we've done is we've taken lattice Heisenberg chains, and we've chosen lattice chains because we can compare directly to sort of traditional 2D DMRG results by student Meyer and White. Uh, for numbers, um, and uh, oh, okay, so first of all, this case is an is a anisotropic Heisenberg model, so the the <coughs> chains are coupled more strongly than the coupling between the chains. Okay, so so there's J along here, uh, which is five times stronger than the J between these. Um, and the thing about the these isotropic Heisenberg chains is their spectra can be uh, separated up into spin-on numbers. So there's some number some some numbers of of particles that we can organize our spectrum by. And uh, what's happened here is we've looked at um, keeping uh, just the two spin-on states and then keeping the two plus the four spin-on states um, and then calculating the ground state energy as you go up in size. Um, and you can see that uh, actually adding the four spin-on states really doesn't do very much. Okay, so the two spin-on states have already got a huge amount of, of this energy. Um, and I think the reason that you, I think you did this data, Robert, the, the reason is that you haven't gone up here is this is just too large, 2 to the 8 was too large to keep all the states, right? Yeah, so in this case here, uh, and 2 to the 12 definitely was too large to keep all the states. Um, but the point is that you are really capturing a huge amount of ground state energy already just at the two spin on level. So there's an idea here that maybe we could learn something, uh, learn about how to use the structure of our, um, of our 1D theories to truncate in a better way. Uh, and then even going to the isotropic limit, so okay, so here n equals 4 and n equals 8, they're actually all states. Um, and this is, this is, so yeah, again, this is isotropic, so j equals j perp. In this case, um, we've taken our two spin on states, then the 2 plus 4, and then all the states, 
Um, and then you can actually see that at the two, at the two and four spinless states, well, OK, n equals 8, we haven't captured as much of this energy. But there's a surprising amount of, a of accuracy already in this number just by keeping the two and four spin-on states. Um, and that, I guess, is something to do with the way that the matrix elements fall off in spin-on number in the Heisenberg model. So it's somehow particular models based on what the matrix elements you're coupling are. Even in the isotropic case, you can maybe think of truncations that aren't energy-based, but are based on matrix elements uh, or based on various quantum numbers that could kind of help you here. OK, and so that's really uh, that's the, the conclusion. So I didn't make a conclusion slide. But uh, so the idea is that we, um, we think we can learn something about 2D in some cases by studying these anisotropic systems of coupled chains. Um, and there's also some software available uh, which you can play with, and uh, all the bugs are my fault. Um, so, except uh, there's some built-in models, and the bugs in those are Robert's fault. So, uh, so it's available. And it's written in such a way that you can um, essentially drop in the spectrum and matrix elements of your favorite models and join them together and sort of try and study these things both in time evolution and static properties. Um, and you can take advantage of abelian symmetries at the moment. Uh, what would be great in the future is to take advantage of non-abelian symmetries because I think that would massively improve the algorithm. Okay, well, thank you very much. Using this method, you can probably extract lots of quantities about 3D Ising model compactified in a circle, which is what exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Which are some universal quantities which are not currently known mm -hmm. and which could be used uh, to do non trivial cross checks with the bootstrap about what happens when you. Because there are some non very non-trivial consistency conditions mm -hmm. which follow from conformal invariance, which uh, you know tell you what is more or less supposed to happen when you put the easing model on a circle. Right. And while those conditions, you know, in principle are known, but not much was done about them because there was little like contact with experiment, you know, nothing is measured and so on. But Perhaps with this setup that you have, which is very powerful, it seems you know, one can start some interplay between the bootstrap and this calculation. Well, certainly. Um, so, like critical exponents, which you measure, okay, mm -hmm. it's just one quantity, mm -hmm. and you know you just get it more or less. But but there are many other quantities which you could measure and which we don't know at all, which could also be like compared in, in a very non-trivial way. Okay, well that would be great to do that. I mean, now that the code is. Um is somewhat more robust than it was as well. I think there's probably a good chance of, of static, actually managing. Static quantities. Yeah, yeah. Well, static quantities are definitely easier, easier to approach. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Could you say something a little bit about how you detect this phase transition? Because naively, I might imagine the the like uh, disordered phase Hilbert space and the ordered phase Hilbert space are pretty different, I mean, they're different sectors of the Hilbert space, right? So yeah, so, so if you look at the raw data here, what you can do is get to some finite <coughs> finite gap. You can't get to the gap okay. with this, right? Um, and, um, and in fact, in other data where I did since, where you, know, you go past this, what happens is this eventually becomes inaccurate and sort of tails off, I think. For, well, not inaccurate, but you, you get a finite gap, sorry. So you, it, won't, it won't come and close. Um, and so that's why Robert's, I guess, improved it in this way with this sort of RG for in terms of the cutoff. Um, You've done lots of finite size scaling. And yeah, so we did we did finite size scaling uh, as well. So we also <coughs> did scaling of the gap, uh, the real gap, and we also did some finite size scaling of what's called the entanglement gap. So this this gap in the entanglement spectrum God damn it, between here and here, um, and there are s there's a kind of conjecture, as far as I'm aware, it is of, of how that should scale with system size, and you can detect the transition point very well in both, and it agrees very well, both this finite scaling of the real gap 
and the entanglement gap. And that's kind of interesting because the entanglement gap is a property just of the ground state wave function, whereas, of course, to get the finite gap, you have to calculate the ground state and the first excited state. So, uh, so yeah, so you can, I think you can see the transition here, definitely, uh, but you can't, you can't actually drive your system into it. You can get it through scaling. Have you tried doing the entanglement analysis in Heisenberg? Because I think there's no, some subtleties there. Not yet, actually. I haven't, I really haven't, I haven't looked at the entanglement spectrum uh, carefully at all since, since this, actually. No further questions. Let me let me let's let's thank Andrew again. Thanks. <laughs>